Hey, folks, today's sponsor is AdamandEve.com. How do you like that, huh? Get 50% off any item along with free gifts and shipping when you enter WTF at the checkout. That's AdamandEve.com. Lock the gate! Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. How? What the fuck? Number WTF. And it's also, eh, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fucking compulsive gamblers that I'm seeing down in the basement here, or the lobby, or the casino, or the Foxwoods uh, Casino? Here in Connecticut, what the fuckers? Was that too long? This is Mark Marin. This is WTF. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry if I sound edgy. I'm sorry if I sound weird. I've been at the Foxwoods Casino in whatever the name of the town is, Connecticut, for three days. Three days. This is not my natural habitat. Is this anyone's natural habitat? Who the fuck comes to these places? Where do these people come from? Do cracks in the earth open and release these people, these troll-like obese people, these people dragging oxygen tanks behind them, and Asians, hund- hundreds of Asians, thousands, it seems. And I've, again, I've resolved my issues with Asians, but they seem, there seem to be a lot of Asians up here in the woods of Connecticut. This place is in the middle of the fucking woods. Maybe I should slow the fuck down. Oh, my God. I got to slow down. Oh, just take a breath, man. Take a breath. It's all right, dude. All right, you ch- you chose to take the gig. You were in New York. You did two great shows at the Bell House. Uh, what a great time that was. Thanks for coming out. First show, very interesting, a little odd. Uh, I know it was a, a difficult experience for some of you. It was hot. The air conditioner wasn't working. But, boy, did it turn out to be wild. And the second show was genius. It was. Not, I'm not calling myself a genius. The The ensemble was amazing. Tom Sharpling. You know what? i got to be honest with you guys. I think me and Sharpling got to do a show together. I don't know what the show is, but uh, if you're not listening to the best show, uh, you really should be listening to the best show. That's Tom Sharpling's show, WFMU. And I I don't know, you you know, for a long time, I didn't think, uh, you know, we were friends or we were going to be friends. But after the other night, and you'll hear it when I put that show up, I think him and I should just do a general review show. I think it should just be Mark and Tom review shit. Mark and Tom... uh, talk about things they want to talk about in a slightly critical bent and they talk to each other i'm pitching that i'm pitching that to you people but let me get to this this episode is sponsored in part by comedy central watch the premiere of john benjamin has a van next week it's a new series two nights two episodes next tuesday and wednesday june 14th and 15th at 10 30 9 30 central go to cc.com for more info and i i went to the premiere of this and I talked to John, I watched his show, and I got some serious fucking laughs. John Benjamin is a seriously fucking funny guy, and this is a great show. So watch that. John Benjamin has a van. Next week, two nights, Tuesday and Wednesday, June 14th and 15th, 10.30, 9.30 Central. It's fucking hilarious. All right, let's get back to this. I'm at Foxwoods, all right? The show's not, they're fine. The club is fine. I really appreciate you what the fuckers coming out to the shows. I know this is not your natural environment. I see hipsters coming in. Well, not hipsters, but, you know, people of my ilk, perhaps people with some facial hair and a plaid shirt that's uh, short sleeved. They walk in. I realize that they're in an alien environment. I'm in an alien environment, but we're going to do this. So the shows have not been that populated. I don't mind playing for small audiences. It's been very interesting up here. And I'm happy to say that I have not gambled compulsively, though I understand it. I fucking understand it. But I am so happy at this point in my life that if I lose $100, $150, I feel like such total shit that I cannot gamble anymore. That's what I'm telling myself today. I have one more day here. I've allotted myself $300 to lose. I am down $175. I could walk, folks. I could walk. I don't know if that's going to happen. Ryan Singer is here. We're planning on getting off the grounds today to avoid the tables. And quite honestly, there's no, I, there is no glamour in this shit. I have never seen uh, c- casinos are so consistently populated with what seems to be. I, I can't even explain the people who are up here. I, but they all seem to have something in common. 
that is they seem to have given up on themselves. Is that possible? Is could that be the theme? I mean, they've just given up on themselves, and they they they'll just sit there and play nickel slots, dollar slots, blackjack, and it looks like when they're not sitting at a table, all they're doing is is eating ice cream or Twinkies or or Cheetos, it, just sitting alone, shoveling them into their face until they no longer fit on the couch, and then once or twice a year they waddle into the Foxwoods Casino. That's what it looks like to me. Oh, and Asians. And I, again, I don't understand what, what that's about. And everybody's got a fucking system. Everybody's got a system. I sat down at a table. I thought, well, I'm here. Let's do some blackjack. This will be fun. I sit down at a table with an available chair. It's me, two Asian guys, an Asian lady, and a guy with an oxygen tank. All right? And a compulsive gambler guy who within, within 30 seconds lost like – $500 on three hands and it looked like he had a face that was it was in a, in a type of, of grimace that could only be relieved temporarily by winning one hand of blackjack I saw him win one the grimace turned into half a smile and then he doubled everything and lost everything and walked away within seven minutes losing $500 and as he walked away and made a phone call I realized that that guy was probably here Every night, and he was calling someone to get more money. So where's the glory in that? And then the Asian people, they're just giving me stink eye. I'm the last guy on the round of the table. I get the last card. It's all on me to play appropriately, which I don't like. I don't like to be beholden to rules where I want to take some chances. And I'm just getting stink eye from these three Asian people, one who had a goatee, and that makes me automatically think he has some wisdom. So I made a choice for a card, and he looked at me and went, Duh. I swear to God, he made that noise. And then he, uh, he nodded in, in, a, in a yes, and I felt like I had been, I'd been accepted into something, some long tradition of things. And I felt like we were friends and that I would, I would listen to him throughout the next three hands as to how to... to, to, to to take what card and when to hit. He was a wise man because of the goatee and the strange guttural noise he made and the nod of approval. So that's been my experience. But uh, I, I do want you to rest assured I am not a compulsive gambler. Uh, I cannot get into it. I have too deep a fear of losing money. And as I've always said, I'd much rather play here at an Indian casino than I would in Vegas because when you played an Indian casino... Quite honestly, if you lose, you feel like you're helping in a way. You, you feel like you're giving back. You, you know, they've been through a lot. This, I, I had nothing to do with it, but I do have a bit of guilt, a bit of burden. Uh, yeah, I lost $175. It's the least I can do. It's the least I can do for what we did to their people. And this place is in the middle of a beautiful, beautiful Connecticut landscape. It's just rolling hills full of pine trees for miles and miles. And then this monstrosity. This fucking monument, if you were to look at it from a satellite, it would look like a, a malignant consumerist tumor on the Connecticut landscape. Just, I, I'm just hoping that one day, you know, when you look out and you see half of the Foxwoods Resort and then you see the rest is just beautiful, pristine countryside, you hope one day that that, that, that is what survives, that the casino will somehow just be pulled down into the earth and live under the earth with the people that seem to come out of the earth to gamble here. I have Brian Poussein on the show today. And, you know, I've known Brian Poussein for years. And I don't think we've ever talked more than two minutes. And I didn't know if he could talk for more than two minutes. And I am thrilled to say that he can. And we had a lovely conversation. And I hope you enjoy that. Okay, it's Adam and Eve Day. You know what that means. AdamandEve.com, you can go there and you can get the discount. You can get the special Mark Marin discount on all your new uh, buzzing toys, the WTF discount. You know how this works. You go to AdamandEve.com, you get 50% off almost any item. You get three free DVDs. You get free shipping, a free gift. I, I know some of you judge me because of these Adam and Eve things, but I tell you, they keep uh, sponsoring with us, so they must uh, they must like us. That means some of you are hiding the fact that you're buying stuff at Adam and Eve, and I don't think you should be ashamed of it. You know what? I don't care if you're ashamed of it. Go ahead and, and, and be ashamed of it, but just pick yourself up some toys. 
some things that you strap on or put in or, you know, wear on your head. Do they have that stuff? Do they have headgear at Adam and Eve? 50% off just about any item. Go to adamandeve.com. You'll find 18,000 adult entertainment products. 18,000. That's toys, lingerie, uh, things you wear on your head, on your face, uh, uh, on your ass, maybe uh, on your things that strap on. I can't. I'm not. Look, if you need a new vibrator, go. All right? You get 50% off. You get the free shipping, three DVDs, a free gift. Then that's at uh, adamandeve.com. You go there, and when you're, you you get to the pay part, you enter uh, WTF as the offer code, and uh, that's how it works, adamandeve.com. Go have fun. Go have the kind of fun that you probably hide. Do that. Brian Poussain in the garage here at the Cat Ranch. Um, I'm glad you came by because, like, I feel like, like, uh, I remember you in such a weird way. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I like we were in San Francisco. You were a San Francisco guy. You were starting out when me and Blaine and Patton moved there. Right. And uh, you were just this tall guy, long hair. Uh-huh. You always wore a hat of some kind. Right. Well, I was already balding at like 22, I think. Uh, <laughs> Is I that, was holding on to that. Yeah, yeah. How old were you? Because you didn't wear glasses. No. Uh, well, I was wearing contacts at the time. Okay. Right? Yeah, but uh, God, when we met, if it was 90, I would have been 20. 92. 92, I, I would have been so. 26. Like, you, you were just this this massive force, uh-huh. and I could never quite register where you were coming from exactly. I didn't know. <laughs> no, back yeah. then, I just wrote what was funny, yeah. and I was... Uh, I'm so glad I get to do this because yeah. uh, I feel like a, a lot of people come on and they talk about like, oh, you always hated me and that yeah. kind of thing. But I, I always looked up to you, yeah. and uh, it was like you and Rhodes. Uh, you know, when when you guys first came to the city, I was like, oh, these guys know who they are. Yeah, and and I didn't at that point. Like, right, I was sort of reaching for things. Like in '87 when I started, I called myself the Piranha, and I wanted to be like Sam Kennison and Dice. <laughs> I swear. And and uh, you, you had know, one just, name. I well, no, I called Brian Piranha Posehn. Oh, but, okay, all right. But it was also like when you know Bobcat had a nickname. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Slayton was the pit bull. I had no idea. And it was one of those things. Uh, you know, it's like oh, I need this. I yeah. need a hook. And right. I'm so you know, I had no clue. I had no idea that you were once the Piranha. <laughs> oh yeah, awful. <laughs> and then. Uh, but when you met me, I was kind of the grunge comic, you right. know. Yeah. Uh, Pearl Jam had broke real big, and I right. was really into that stuff. Yeah, because I'd been a metal kid, but then uh, grunge came out, and I was still buying Pantera records and that kind of thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, right, you grunge were going- became this thing, and it wasn't like I wasn't. I want to call myself a poser, but I just was kind of looking for. An identity, uh, you know. Well, I think, like, I mean, I did that. Christ, I mean, I can't. Like, I mean, like, I sit here and condescend sometimes, but I mean, look what I'm doing with the hair on my face. I mean, at some point, <laughs> you're going to level off on something, and <laughs> right. you, you just hope that whatever's on the inside matches it. You know what I mean? Right. So, but you were older, and then also you'd been doing it longer, and you'd already had like uh, the comedy store and all that. So right. When you came to San Francisco, you and Rhodes. I mean, Rhodes had started like at what sixteen or something. Yeah, and we didn't know each other. He was there a little before me. And but, that, yeah, that was Rhodes, the long-haired Rhodes. Right, but my point was you guys oh, right. knew who you were on right, stage. Right, And when you first came, and even Patton, you know, I don't know if he would ever admit it, we were all like, wow, you know, yeah. wow, Marin and Rhodes, sure. these are these two defined characters. I think and Patton that's... would admit it for maybe a week window. Like, you know, that, <laughs> right, there, right, there was right. a week or two where, right. <laughs> where he looked up to you and then... <laughs> yeah. But we were roommates. He and I hooked up right away because we were like, he was like two years younger than me and uh, had about the same amount of time on stage at that point. Did he move in with you? Because what? Because where did you come from that area, right? Uh, yeah, I come from Northern California, but I was living with Ngaio Bielema at That's the time. That's what I remember. I remember this, going to your house to smoke pot oh, and yeah. then leaving retarded. Oh, yeah. Just the goofy stoner house. We had like every we had like the six foot pong the three right, foot that was pong. It. like i went over <laughs> yeah. there and it was like i'm standing on a stool oh yeah, yeah sucking on a pipe we had that giant one where you needed a spotter and if then, you weren't me if i could do it i could reach <laughs> with my crazy yeah. giant arms but and then uh, i just remember a guy was one of those guys like you were always pretty quiet so i never understood i never really knew what was going on in your head and i always thought like uh I, I you know i didn't ever assume that you didn't like me but i always assumed that like i don't have any idea how to talk to that guy but do you remember we went to uh, New York? We all did uh, um, 
two drink minimum. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yes, I did. I look at that night like you really kind of opened my eyes to like I'd never been in New York before, and you obviously had. That was the one where Jake Johansson hosted. Yeah. What happened? But you and I left. Right. Like, like I think at, at one point, if I remember correctly, you know, we were probably high. Yeah, but, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm having a little black spot with it. But I think you were like. You've never been here, you right, know, yeah, one yeah. of those things yeah, yeah. like, oh, dude, you got to see this. Yeah, and then you took go? me to clubs. Ah, uh, yeah. And we went to uh, the improv and we saw Mark Cohen. And I was like, this guy is the biggest fucking hack I've ever seen. And yeah. you were like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Cohen's really funny. Yeah. And uh, he's making fun of that. He's yeah, doing yeah. hack jokes yeah. on purpose. Yeah. And I went, oh, yeah. like I, I was just like <laughs> yeah, this yeah. naive kid to yeah, comedy yeah. still. Yeah, that was amazing because yeah. the improv was still around. Yeah, yeah, we went there. So you got to see that. And we went to a couple different places that night. The original uh, brick wall. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Did we go to the Lower East Side and eat or anything? Uh, we probably got a slice at some point, yeah. but, but uh, no, I remember just kind of, uh, oh, you know, the you. older comic, even though you weren't that much no, older I'm than not. me. What are I you, two so. years older than me? I'm 47. Yeah, I'm, I'll be 45 in July. So, right, uh, so it wasn't yeah. like I was like, come yeah. here, little boy. No, but it was like, I, I knew. like I said, you yeah. were more schooled and you more, uh, you know, well, I'm so glad worldly that, yeah. in stand-up. I'm so glad I took you to that place. The improv. Yeah, no, I remember that night. Because uh, it was like, it was, that place was like, that was the original place, and there was all those weird old pictures right. of like, you know, Andy Kaufman. And, right, you know, we did, yeah, and we didn't do sets. No. We just watched. We just yeah. hung out. We had a drink. I don't and, even know uh, where I was at with them. It was I was living in New York. I was living in San Francisco. Well, right. They so, knew you. We walked in, and they were like, Mark, it yeah. was one of those things. Like, so, yeah, you guys can hang out. And, yeah. And we hung out, and, uh, you know, it was, I, I remember watching Cohen and going, I don't get this. And you go, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. And then even after we left, yeah. I was like, that guy is pretty bad, dude. And you're yeah. like, no, he wasn't. And well, you kind of explained it to me. And then Cohen wound up being one of my good friends. You know? He did, right? Yeah, and I wound up really you know, thinking he was hilarious. <laughs> well, he's a, he was a big stoner. And he, he was very – the thing about Cohen was there was these, there was these different kinds of acts, you know, and he was a, a great MC. Yeah. And uh, he was so fucking fast. But he was also kind of like East Coast Kindler. Yeah, that's where, right. Where that's he right. was kind of yep. messing with the form. That's right. And at that point, I didn't know that. That's like, right. I, I just thought he was doing lame jokes. Jokes. Well, there was an arrogance around yeah. San Francisco. Like, you know, San Francisco, right. like, this is where the uh, comedy artists uh, yeah. reside to some degree. Yeah, and I guess I fell into that a little. I mean, yeah. I came from Sacramento. I started in, like, some fuck? shitty open mic up What the in fuck Sacramento. is going on in Sacramento? Who knows now? Oh, it's total meth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I, like, every time horrible. I go up there, I don't know, you know, what's holding the city together. I know there are probably decent people up there, but I've never gotten a sense uh, downtown's cool. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm uh, I'm going back up there, and I'm not going to do the comedy club anymore. I'm trying to do that in most cities now too. I'm I'm uh, just going to do a rock club up there and and play to the cool people, and then get out of there. Yeah, in one night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I have done a few rock clubs, but I find that I there's some part of me I think it's out of spite or or, or entitlement that I'm like I'm going to comedy clubs right. because if I can sell tickets now, I I I, uh, I owe it like I, I owe it to myself. To right. be victorious in those places. Right. Where were you just at? And you were in Florida? Yeah, I uh, did a couple of rock clubs. I did uh, Tallahassee and uh, Pensacola. Do you fill them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do. That's I'm doing great. really good uh, or really well. I, I, I've been having a blast. And, um, you know, I still, when I do comedy clubs, I do well there too, but then there's still those people. I know. And it's I, like, you I know, know, I still get bachelorette parties. I got and, You know, uh, and I still get the 60-year-old lady, the conservative lady with yeah. her arms crossed going, is this guy going to talk about his penis the entire time? Yes. And yes, I am. <laughs> Sadly, it's all I have. Dude, but... <laughs> I was in Madison. There was a. They told me before the show that there was a party of 100 sorority girls and their dads. Okay? Oh, yeah, I saw you tweeted about that. Right, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then there was a bachelorette party up front, and then a right-wing drunk dude started heckling me. And I was like, "This is this the trifecta? I mean, was wow. it, how was so that did being you have challenged? any... Fans in that crowd, and that I audience? did. I had about a hundred, but I I had the guy. Oh, so this is a big out. room. It was. I had the guy kicked out, which I don't usually do, but uh -huh. I knew because of the situation was already going to be difficult. I didn't have time to babysit him, like standing up giving me right, mock, right. mock standing ovation. Oh, I just had one of those in Minneapolis. What do you do? And happened? they kicked him out before I could. Oh, because uh, the guy brought a bottle in, uh -huh. and I didn't see that part. But I just saw as soon as I walked out, the arms crossed. He just looked like a. 
you know, and some of these guys like me, but the, he just looked like a mixed martial arts guy. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, I was like, oh, I can't call him a fucking asshole because yeah. he'll kill me. <laughs> that's the, yeah. Well, that's what happened at this place. The guy said, why don't you come down here? And I'm like, that's it. Get the fuck out. Right. Just get him out of here. Right. And, and it was good because none of the, uh, he had already fucked with the first guy. Right. So there was none of that, like, uh, like judging me yeah. for being a pussy. Right. Isn't that fucked up that I think that? That, well, like, no, I should be I, able to manage this. Yeah, but I was at that show where, at Largo. Where, oh, where I got decked? <laughs> How many people were there? It's one of those, that was, I was with Rath, and Rath's the one who pulled, saved you. Yeah, he yeah, pulled yeah, that guy but, off. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God, because I don't know Thank how much God of it. Thank God we were out in the back getting high. <laughs> Thank God we wanted to watch you. <laughs> Lucky for you. I, man, I, I'm so glad people pulled that guy off of me. He yeah. seemed baffled by the whole thing. Right, right. So, okay, so here's what, what amazed, uh, not amazed me, I don't want to appear condescending. There was a period where, you know, I chose to go do comedy and everyone else chose to come to L.A. and perhaps, you know, find a community and do interesting things with right. other people. And the next thing I know... You know, you're part of the Mr. Show crew. Uh -huh. And because I had no real knowledge of you really speaking for longer than a minute or a minute and a half, uh -huh. I was like, how the hell did Brian Poussain, does he even talk? Right. <laughs> well, I I wrote. I mean, that was the thing, you know, the guys that didn't make that transi transition, you know, did you, did you, were you writing sketches? No, no, I wasn't yeah, judging yeah. you, but well, I wasn't, no. but it was just sort of like, where did that come from? How did that, uh, you know, how did you align yourself with those guys? Well... I think part of it was I wasn't as established as you guys, yeah. some of you other guys, so I panicked. Like, uh, when comedy clubs started closing, I was like, what am I going to do? You know, I don't want to MC around the country, and I yeah. don't even know if I'll be able to make a living doing that. So at the end of my run in San Francisco, I was already writing jokes uh, or writing, you know, that kind of stuff like uh, I got to work on a yeah I got to work on a late night show or I got to get an MTV job and I hooked up with Rath Dave Rath my manager at right. the time is he still he your managed, manager yeah oh yeah forever and uh, I'll never leave the guy yeah. and then uh, and me and Patton he um, found Patton and I and he along was, with four hundred other comics yeah but you, you guys I'm kidding. <laughs> But we were kind of as big yeah, guys you besides Janine, yep. and he kind of pushed us into that. He got me my first writing gig down in L.A., and I went down like it was a temporary thing, like in 93, 94, yeah. where I thought I was going to go back to San Francisco. But at that time, I really was like, I got to get off the road. I can't make enough doing this. Right. And clubs were closing. Right. And there's we also lost the improv around that time right. in San Francisco. That was a fun room. So, yeah, and it was so, but it was kind of the scary time as a stand-up, for me at right. least. Right. Yeah. It was like, how am I going to do this? I have to try something else. And I didn't ever think I would fall into acting. I mean, I really just wanted to come down here and, and get writing gigs. And, well, and it's amazing to me that you had the wherewithal to acknowledge at that time, because I talk about this on the show a bit, that like, I never considered it. And, and I think it's a responsible thing to do. So even you know, despite the, the, uh, the THC haze, right. you took responsibility for yourself. Yeah, but in, in, the, in your defense, I, I kind of think that you were maybe more of a pure stand-up at that point and, I think and like I that you know I'm still <laughs> well no but you know what i mean like yeah. i think that's there are guys that that's not all that you do but that's like your right your focus yeah, but, but i talk when i talk to young guys today or if they write me i say look you know don't put all your eggs in one basket i mean if you can write yeah. you know you can you know there's work there now did you were you a disciplined you know guy in in high school or what <laughs> no <laughs> wait i barely made it out of high school i uh i Literally at the my my senior year, I had to start doing other things to get credits to graduate with my oh. class. Oh, really? Where, like uh, what? Well, I had to uh, go up to junior college up in Santa Rosa and take yeah. a film class at night. Oh, really? And well, that must have been good. Is yeah, that a fun. good thing? It was. It wound up being really positive. Yeah, but you know, it was bad at home because yeah. my mom. Uh, you know, what kind of family you come from? A uh, single mom. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and I'm the only child. My dad died when I was two, so oh, my wow. mom, uh, my mom struggled, went to college, and and while I was little, and and uh, grew up in the Bay Area, and then went to San Jose, and then moved to Sonoma at nine years old, and uh, just was miserable. Yeah, uh, one, you know, you talk about you know like where does this come from, and you know, and I was the kid that uh, memorized comedy to kind of make friends. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, yeah, really? I, oh, yeah, yeah. I were you always uh, really tall? I mean, were you the outsider guy? Yeah, I'm really, really skinny. That yeah. was the funny thing. Like, that's what people made fun of me for. And now I'm a big, fat asshole. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but, like, that was one of the things I got ridiculed for yeah. was that, like, I had these weenie arms and, yeah. you know, just super skinny. They called you weenie arms? No, no. I, they called me oh. turtle because I was so shy. Yeah. And I would, you know, I Hunch would hunch. Over. And I came my first day of of uh, fourth grade at yeah. this new school in Sonoma. Yeah. And I'm wearing a green jacket. Yeah. So I look like a turtle. <laughs> yeah. And it's stuck. <laughs> and like there were kids in junior high and high school that called me turtle and had no idea why. Yeah. It, you know, it was but you chose thing. piranha. I mean. Later. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you weren't going to go well, with turtle? Yeah. I, well, I'm, I could have been the snapping turtle. Yeah, I was yeah. fighting back, you know. <laughs> ridiculous so uh, well that's so like not having a dad around because i talked to a lot of uh, uh dudes you know it seems to me that that when you don't have a a dad around or the dad is not around like my dad that there's some kind of uh you, you sort of there's a there, you have this push inside of you right that, that i don't i can't quite explain it but there are guys i know like you know like louie like judd uh -huh. i mean there's so many cats who did well in comedy right. and really used comedy to to save their asses? Well, it's that their that dad's became a serial killer. You know? Well, that was a choice, sure. <laughs> yeah, and you were yeah. when were you at that crossroads? Oh you, man, you, <laughs> when did, I you, read the books, I did too. I did the work. What was with us in that thing? I got <laughs> those knows? books up here. I mean, there was a period there where me, you, and Patton were completely submerged yeah, yeah. in morbid curiosity. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and I think it was really it is the most extreme, most disturbing irony. It, it, if if we're if I'm going to criticize ironic disposition uh -huh. to sit. There and go like you know Manson's kind of cool you know it's I it's, was more of an Ed Gein guy and, well, yeah. like I like the the crazy you know small well, they, town guy a little more creative yeah. a little more creative <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know he took it to another level oh, right right and he was hands on you know Manson subcontracted the killing where where Gein would like you know it right. was more intimate well that's how Patton and I bonded like we we met in the um when he had moved there that week. And I remember thinking he was really funny when he, you know, the first time I saw him, like, at a pizza place, and there's, like, four people in the audience. Yeah. And we're both one. just doing whatever we wanted to do. It was, like, in North Beach. Oh, no, yeah. no, it was out by the water, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was awful. But uh, we, I did, like, a River's Edge joke and uh, a reference to that movie, River's yeah, Edge. Yeah. And he had some other, like, serial killer thing. And we started talking. And then we did the uh, competition together and uh, the San Francisco competition. I was the, in the it Fox that year. What year? Day. 92 and must, must have been 92 that was our first year there that was me and yeah. Patton's first year there and uh he did better i think in that but the first week we were driving to all these gigs remember you'd have mm -hmm. to go to walnut creek and sure. you'd have to go i had to, to drive places. rick kearns around like i don't know how to get on letterman i mean I, i've been around a long time oh, man yeah we had a christian guy i can't even remember his name the black dude no no it was like i uh Patton would remember because he didn't smoke as much pot as i did back then but uh we bonded because this guy this poor bastard was driving us around and we're just talking about serial killers and all this dark stuff and all the movies that we yeah. loved and comic books yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know yeah that's like when anime akira first coming out and yeah that kind of thing and we yeah. were already into you know asian cinema jackie chan and yeah. all that so yeah. we bonded over all this stuff and this poor guy had just had no idea <laughs> this poor guy and, was just but it was the forming of our friendship i mean it was these the nights driving out to wanna creek driving yeah, to yeah. san jose the, and, the ongoing uh, conversation about then, the uh, the nuances of comic books. Exactly. And uh, I couldn't stand my roommate situation. I loved Ngaio, but we lived with like three, four other people in that yeah. house. So I'd tell Patton, I got to get something else yeah. going. The stoner co-op. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. Yeah. And uh, there was no way to get work done there. You yeah. just smoke pot all day long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was ridiculous. And even at that point, I was like, I gotta, you know, I gotta kind of focus. And, and it was one of those houses where people just sit around comparing different types of weed. Yeah, and Patton already was so focused and so driven. Yeah, that I was like, yeah, you know, it wasn't like I gotta do what he, you know, I gotta follow this guy. Right. But it, it maybe it was part of that. But anyway, we wound up getting an apartment together, and then he and I started writing sketches together. So that was kind of building well, while we were going yeah. to the Holy City Zoo and getting up and watching that place die. Yeah, and then following you know uh opening for proops i got to open for him a lot so it was like you and proops and Rhodes were kind of these older guys even though you're like, like i said you weren't no, we're that just, much older yeah, yeah. Well, proops is probably is he 50 you, but i don't know who knows but how anyway proops is. but proops like i used to love the way we'd go to walnut creek and he'd have idiots and he yeah. just would not tolerate them. yeah and he'd just rip them yeah, you know yeah. new R ones relentless. yeah yeah it's so great it's kind of dance so, circles swim circles around their brain 
Well, so, that's great that Patton was yeah. there because I think he was always like Patton's one of those guys that was you know good student. You know, yeah, he, like really had like discipline. Yeah, yeah. You're he lucky. went to college. I yeah. barely, you know, I went to junior college and and uh, like I said, barely made it out of high school. So what, dropped out of junior college. I was going to be a journalist, and I uh, interviewed the band Fishbone. Yeah. in Sacramento. Yeah, and uh, they were assholes. And I uh, went back to my uh, journalism teacher, and it was for the school paper. And I go, I, I can't write this article. You know, these guys gave me nothing. And uh, and it was around the same time I was dabbling with stand up. Yeah. And, and uh, I just I dropped out of school, and I said, I'm going to do this for a couple of years and see what happens. Fishbone turned then, you away from the life yeah, of a journalist. Right. It's I swear to God, they were the <laughs> they were a good band. They were great, but the guy didn't give me anything. And I interviewed Angelo, the singer. Yeah. And, uh, I, I remember saying, like, who's your biggest influence? And he's like, Bugs Bunny. And I'm like, great. Okay. Yeah, that's how we're going to go. You're not even being funny. It, you know, you're just being a dick. <laughs> but you got to thank him. You should write yeah, him a oh, letter. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> say, uh, for sure. If I ever meet asshole. them, I will say, you You know, So did, was your you Was your mom, life. like, okay with it? She actually was. Yeah. You know what it was? She was just so happy that I found anything. Oh, really? You know? Were and, you pretty miserable? Yeah, yeah, and uh, like I said, just barely making it through, and and we went through a time. She kicked me out when I was seventeen, and uh, Pot. Uh, no, uh, ripped her off. She went on a vacation, and and I was a spoiled little brat. I didn't get to go on the vacation, right? Because I, you know, uh, didn't have any money, couldn't help her. Yeah, you know, she barely could afford to go. Yeah, but anyway. So I trashed the house while she was gone, and and uh, you know yeah. stole stuff from her. And oh really? I was an asshole. <laughs> what did you do? I was you, a shitty kid. Did you go sell it or? No, no. I would like uh, uh, well used her credit card to buy records and, oh, and oh, that kind of stuff. And she, this is the greatest thing. Like yeah. my mom thought I was on drugs, yeah. and I wasn't till she kicked me out. <laughs> like. She kicked me out, and I went to Phoenix and found speed. Oh, no. <laughs> like, a lot of talking. That's like when meth was invented, <laughs> yeah. you know, at the end of the 80s The old, there. weird, weird kind of yellowy kind. Oh, of. yeah, yeah, crystal meth. And, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the and pure crank CR. And, yeah. oh, oh. How long were you fucking on that? Uh, I was dicking around with it for a couple of years, but then yeah. uh, wasn't even a weed head till... Got your teeth still, though, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you kept <laughs> well, your teeth. Yeah. What'd you What'd you learn on speed? Because that stuff, like I, I never got into it, but I did a few times, and I'm like, this is great for an hour, but then you're up yeah. for three fucking days. You know, you're drawing mazes, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fixing things. Yeah, I would. I lived at my grandfather's house, and I would like take his vacuum cleaner apart in the middle of the night. And... <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. Did you retain any of that knowledge? Oh, no, no. no. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was that. And then, like, I thought it would get me through college, or, you know, through, I was starting JC up there, uh, our American River Oh, so college. you're doing it to study. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. those papers turned out great. Yeah, I bet. Super well-written yeah. and focused. <laughs> well, but, I'm glad that you didn't fucking stick with that drug. No, no. And then I found weed. Uh, I worked at a record store, uh, Tower Records up in Sacramento, and worked with a bunch of potheads. And, uh, you know, grew up in Sonoma, so I was around weed, but uh, didn't like those kids. Didn't like the kids that smoked pot when I was in high school. So it took me finding this this kid who, uh, you know, had a good taste in music and was my buddy and wound up being my roommate. Yeah. And he's the guy who turned me on to good weed and yeah. opened Sacto. And we'd go to the dealer that, like, collected obsidian oh. and had, like... <laughs> Teenage boys, you know, straight out of uh, what's the movie? Uh, uh, the Boogie Nights. The Boogie Nights. Yeah. Swear to God, this guy had like shirtless boys, you know, doing errands in his house, doing yeah. chores and stuff. Right, right, right. And we were so grossed out. I was already by that point wasn't doing any any nose drugs really. Yeah. Uh, I had already stopped that. Like yeah. Phoenix had, you know, <laughs> that, that put the enough. lid on that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but we would go to score weed, and this guy was like. One of those assholes. It's like one sixty fourth uh, Indian, right? You know, so he was totally obsessed with it and like collected obsidian and it's arrowheads. arrowheads. <laughs> yeah, so and he'd show us his arrowheads collection, and then there's some weird kid that's you know uh, vacuuming his house for blow, and uh, and then we, me and my roommate, would just like we got to get the fuck out oh, of here. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> but, the, the, the guy, the, there's nothing worse than the drug dealer with a collection. Oh yeah, because like you know they want to get you high, so you're like, oh yeah, great, because you want to get high, right? And then like the, before they give you your shit or after, then right. they're like, so I want you guys hang out, and you're like, oh no. Margaret Cho had that great joke around oh, no. that when we first met yeah. in San Francisco what was it? of like. Just having to be and pretend they're you're their friend. Yeah. You know, and the whole time you're just like, just fucking give it. <laughs> you know, like, 
That was her punchline, and that always made me laugh because I had already, oh, I'd man. had that guy at that point. But what the sadder part of that relationship is when you do want to hang out. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where you're like, you know, hey, what, what are you guys up to? You got beers, and, and right. you're just watching the other people come and get out. Right, right, right. And then you, it's only a you know a, a matter of time before you become one of the boys vacuuming. So you got to get out. But uh, well, now let's talk about the uh, this this nerd idea because like there is the nerd paradigm. You are a definer of the comedy nerd paradigm, uh-huh. and and I think there are some people that are true nerds and some people that uh, that are not. And I believe that you are. And uh-huh. do you believe you are? Yeah. You know, I've gotten, I remember uh, when Patton and I, maybe five or six years ago, somebody wrote me on the internet saying, like, you and Patton can't call yourself nerds anymore. You know, you, you have girlfriends and you're, and you're successful. And, really? And, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, that's, I still am a nerd. I mean, yeah. for me, nerdiness is just about obsession. And that's I, right. That's the way I've always been. I mean, for as long as I can remember, when I would get into something, I, I would get into it you know yeah, what yeah, i mean yeah, yeah, like yeah. it would become the thing whether it's finding kiss at nine years old and you know having to f- find every kiss record and then at 10 years old finding acdc and having oh. to go deep and were you in or, the kiss army oh yeah yeah uh and then comics and whatever thing i would get into i would obsess you were into acdc at 10 well, whenever that, yeah, whenever that was. How uh, great were those first six albums? Uh, Seventy-eight. Uh, so I must have been well, actually eleven. Did but, you stay uh, with them through all of it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, when they lost Bond, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I got into the yeah. Well, I was in high school when Back in Black came out. So that's a you great record, had to listen right? To that, right? Yeah. But then, like after that, I'm not as about a couple. Yeah. Uh, for those of uh, what's the yeah. Uh, for those about to rock, we salute you. Uh, that one, uh-huh. and yeah. then there's a, the Rick Rubin produced album. Ball was it Ball? Uh, uh, I, by that point, it? I was into heavier stuff. Right, by the mid '80s, I was into thrash metal. And, and so you uh, started uh, with Kiss. Kiss was my. And then uh, would you move through hair metal line. a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Well, I got into traditional stuff after. Uh, it was like ACDC and then it was Van Halen at right. the end of the 70s. No shame in that, right? And I love them. And then uh, early '80s, it was a lot of the LA bands. Uh, Motley Crue, yeah. uh, uh, Rat, and then British bands like uh, uh, Iron Maiden and yeah. Judas Priest at the same time. And I was always the kid. That's like, a lot to take. Um, yeah. Iron Maiden and Judas Priest yeah. at the same time. So but I was a... such a loner. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys, and it was also the same way with comic books, where you had to pick one. Mm-hmm. Like, you couldn't be a Marvel or a guy and like DC. You had who'd to you, like. Who'd you even have that conversation with? Well, I didn't. Oh, okay. You good. know, yeah. and, but I found out about that stuff later. And with Metal. metal it was always I liked all metal. Yeah. I, I was never like looked down on the hair metal guys. Yeah. I just liked it all. Yeah. Uh, I liked you know the stories. I liked the energy, the aggression, and uh, you know Van Halen. I liked the party stuff, but then I also liked you know when Iron Maiden would do a twelve minute song about you know Rhyme and the Ancient Mariner and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I got into all of it. So and then when I would meet other metalheads, they were like, "Dude, you can't like that and that." Like Motley Crue's gay, and I'm like. I can like whatever the fuck I want to like. You know? <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. a radical, open-minded nerd, <laughs> yeah. metal nerd. Yeah, yeah. The, well, they, I think they pick allegiances. Is what mm-hmm. happens is that they're, and I think that happens uh, in all areas of nerd land. And it's one of the problems I have is that they're, you know, if you if you don't if you aren't a party loyalist, right, then they have to reckon with you as an outsider. You know, who's the drifter with the beard? Right. You know, with the Motley Crue record. He, what does he bring here? Right. But Patton was the same way when we met, and so that's we bonded over that, and like we both were pretty nerdy, uh, you know. Like, but he was way more well read than I was, and and uh, so. But I turned him on to stuff; he turned me on. Well, to I think stuff, that's the way it should be. Was, yeah, you know, because then you're just using it to you're using it like jocks use it. Right. You know, like you're like team what a team Marvel or team you, <laughs> right. you know that, and then you get to this sort. You know, your default is to condescend to anybody that doesn't uh, like what you like. Fuck them. And then as far as it becoming into my comedy, you know, I stopped doing stand-up for a while. You know, when I moved down here. After Mr. Show? Well, like during, you know, I was. Well, let's get into that we transition. Got, I got Mr. Show from being on stage in front of those guys. Uh, and, uh, well, David knew me first from San Francisco. The yeah. Cross was coming up to the city a yeah. lot. Uh, remember when Lisa Langang was booking the improv yep. and yep. Janine would come up. And yep. that's how I met them. And so when I came down to L.A., I was their friend. And I was already a fan of the Ben Stiller show because it was on our, my last year in San Francisco, even though uh, Fox barely had, you know, I saw like two episodes and then Fox fucked, fucked it up or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, 
But I looked up to those guys, and and uh, I was really in a sketch from SCTV, and that that yeah. was uh, my thing. Yeah, you know, everybody at my high school liked Saturday Night Live, and I was always way more an SCTV guy. Yeah, and uh, you know, never thought that I could do that, and um, just started messing around around then. Like I said, so when I came to LA, I already had a sketch packet. I, yeah, you know, I had samples to show Bob when Bob asked for him, and Bob asked a lot of people. And the way I got in was I was ready. Yeah. You know? And uh, Bob's when, intense. Yeah, but when people go, well, how did you make that leap? Sure. You know, and I didn't. I'm like, well, I was fucking ready. Yeah. I wanted to make that leap. And then you guys just went over and, and you... we bonded over being dicks. Yeah. Like <laughs> you and Bob. Well, yeah. yeah, that was the other thing. Like I had this quiet reputation in San Francisco, but I also kind of have the reputation if yeah. you cross me, I, you know, you would dick out. Well, yeah. Yeah. And I had those things. Like, I don't know if you remember, but I would get into arguments with people over music all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of had that surly, you know, I think surly I do, stoner uh, yeah, thing. I think and, I do remember uh, the one time that I saw you get angry about something. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. yeah it was probably, it's in there. Yeah, it was probably Pearl Jam or something. Yeah. But you loved Pearl Jam. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know and that I, was a big argument. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you must have taken a lot of hits for that. <laughs> right. But, and there was Primus and stuff like that. Parent used to give me so much shit for liking Primus, and how can you not like it. Primus? I don't know if you can like. I can't listen to him a lot, but at <laughs> right. least you have to sit there and go. This guy seems to have a shit together. Right, right, right. You know, he's got a vision here. But that was my nerdy thing. I would defend those bands to the death. But uh, <laughs> right. so, Kirk and I met at Virgin Records, mm -hmm. and he had heard about me mm -hmm. through Cross, and knew that I had moved down, and and. Uh, he came over, and yeah. he's, like, socially retarded, and he came over yeah. and tried and, to connect and, with me. Edgy. But he... So what do you do? Yeah, but, yeah. He, but he also had heard that I was funny, so right. he came to talk to me, and I'm wearing, like, a sub-pop jacket that says loser, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, long hair and a, yeah. and a hat and whatever. You and, still had and, the long hair. Yeah, at that point. And uh, I was just like, oh, hey, man. You know, <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> Probably gave him nothing. What did he say? And uh, with that first conversation, it was it was awkward. Nothing yeah. happened. But then, uh, you know, he went back to Cross, going, "Hey, this kid's kind of a dickhole." <laughs> and Cross is like, "Yeah, but he's he's pretty funny." So <laughs> yeah. uh, then, you know, Wrath ran that room, uh, the Diamond Club. I don't remember that. Well, I think that, I missed you it. weren't here. I yeah. don't think at that point. Yeah, and uh, it was this great space. Uh, that they talk about in the Mr. Show book and and uh, and that spin article that just came out where we were doing shows almost every night. Like Laura Milligan would host a show as Mr. Would, show. Well, no, no, it was before it just, oh, Mr. Okay. Show, and it was right before those guys got their deal. Mm -hmm. So they were doing shows there because they knew Wrath, and I was doing. I did my own sketch show where I I called it a one man show, but I used like Karen Kilgariff and all these other people to act in these sketches. Yeah. I wrote all the sketches, yeah. and I performed in every sketch, yeah. and I used Benson, too, because Benson was my writing partner at yeah. MTV when I first moved down here. What was, it? What was that project? We got this shitty job called Trashed. It was like... A, I remember that. It was remote control, but we would uh, destroy your stuff. Right, I remember so that. It was like college students would come on and bring their surfboard. Yeah, I you remember know, auditioning If they win, they that. get to keep their surfboard. Yeah. Chris Hardwick was our host. Right, I think I auditioned fresh for Fresh out that. of college. Yeah, right? yeah. He that was really his first hosting. Oh job? yeah, yeah. He was a kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, we were doing these shows every night. Yeah. And that's when Bob, uh, I even asked Bob to be in one of my sketches, and he read the sketch and he liked it. It was kind of an SNL style sketch, and then it jumped off and went this crazy place. What does that mean when you think SNL style sketch? Because I don't quite understand. Uh, like I don't understand sketch. Well, sometimes. it was traditional live. It felt like a traditional live sketch. Right. But then it went to a different place. Right. I, I had a different twist. And it was, uh, the premise was, and this is the one that he liked the most, but uh, it was a guy who uh, falls asleep when he lies. Right. And so he has his boss over. Right. Uh, you know, and I have Karen's playing my wife. Yeah. And I've got to make this impression. It's just kind of a traditional jumping off point, like, oh, the boss is coming. Yeah. You got to make a good impression. Yeah. But... And then yeah, you find problem. out that when I talk to him, you know, and I'm telling him, like, hey, I really think you're great. And like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't get through this. And, like, he's one getting day. madder and madder. <laughs> and it was just one of those. And he liked it. He liked the structure and he liked the writing. And so when they got their deal, I was, you know, one of the first people they talked to. And then at the acting sort of, when did you make the transition? Because there was definitely, like, you know, you've come into yourself. You look good. You know, you, you, you seem like a, you, you're whole and together. Mm -hmm. There's no confusion anymore. But there was a decision to, to put the glasses back on, 
to cut the hair and become yeah. sort of a, a character. In yeah, a way. well, yeah, I owe the haircut to my ex. I don't know if you knew this girl, Paula. I probably uh, met her. She, uh, I went out with her for about five years. Yeah. We met on Trashed, the MTV show. Yeah. And then she wound up being the wardrobe girl for uh, Mr. Show for the entire run. Right. And um, what happened was, uh, you know, I was wearing the hat every day, and uh, underneath the hat, it was looking grim. Yeah. It was <laughs> it was getting worse and worse. And that's what you were hiding, though, right? Uh, you know, my dad died at 23, yeah. and he was bald when he died. How'd he die? Uh, a, a rare blood disease, oh. and then uh, the fucking hospital uh, uh, fucked it up and uh, gave him something he was allergic to, and he went into a coma. When you were two? Yeah, yeah. And was uh, it a genetic thing? Was there a fear of a... Uh, no, it wasn't, but oh. it was some really rare thing. And, and uh, I mean, yeah, there was always the fear. I One of the reasons I have a kid at 43 is, uh, you know, I I thought I was going to die always. That's I never thought I would live to to be as old as I am. And, and just because of him, I not that there was any real reason. The doctor never said, hey, you're going to be right. like him. Right. I just thought I was. And uh, so I never, you know, anyway, wanted to hook up or, or you know, it was really that active of fear in your Oh, mind. yeah, yeah, yeah. There, uh, yeah, I didn't want to bring a kid in and die on him. Yeah, and I still think about it all the time. Now I'm a big unhealthy bastard, and, and I'm afraid that, you he's know. He's going to clutch your chest. And... Oh, shit. Like, his second birthday's in one month, and I'm yeah. like, am I going to die on his birthday? No, <laughs> oh, I swear to God, dude. That's you know? so, I'm sorry you're going through that, bro. No. <laughs> that is... And that's the other thing. Like, when I listen to the show and you talk about darkness and all yeah. that, like, I was going to therapy the whole time you knew me in San Francisco. And, really? Yeah. Well, right before I moved, the reason I was able to move to San Francisco is both of my grandfathers died within one month. And they were my only male, uh, you know, role models. Uh, role models. Yeah. And they both died. And one of them died really horribly. Uh, he uh, had Parkinson's and dementia. And he uh, went on a walk and never came back. And uh, I looked for him for about two weeks up in Sacramento. And uh, I was doing stand-up at the time. But then... Uh, what uh, year was that? Get off the... Uh, uh, 90, uh -huh. 90, 91, right before I moved to the city. And I was able to move because I got his inheritance. Right. And uh, they, now, what did they find him? Oh yeah, yeah. We, uh, it's so like cliche. Cub Scouts found him. He's just out in the woods. Yeah, and like it was shitty because people thought they found him. I was on I was on TV, local TV, up in Sacramento. You know, going, hey, if you see, you know, holding up pictures, if you see my grandfather. So people were calling in and saying, oh, I saw him. You know, he took the light rail system. He was downtown. Uh, he never left Fair Oaks. He right. never left his little neighborhood. Right. Uh, he fell into the American River. He, he fell off a cliff. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think he suffered. Like, he had, right. he had a rock. And yeah. It was fucking awful. But uh, we, me and my uncle were looking for him for two weeks. And oh. So when you met me, That's uh, you, you you know, I was at a therapist's two three times a week at that point in san francisco to deal with specifically uh, yeah the yeah. abandonment uh, or the abandonment dying. death and just uh you know the morbid... who the fuck am i and, right and uh why is this happening to me like why uh you know and and that had a lot you know like the metal also helped with that but then also kind of made me a dark guy you know, sure inside but... well that's like also that morbid fascination we had with serial, oh, serial killers, killers and everything and else that, yeah, yeah, yeah. i think that like when you come from a what, whether it's you know a lack of of personal identity or or you have that that dread you know because mm -hmm. I had that dread I always thought I was going to die as complete fucking obsessed with you know but disease. where did that come from my, I think it, mine came from the fact that my father was a doctor and he was not very emotionally attentive. So I knew, you know, somewhere innately that if I was dying, he would pay attention to me. Oh, shit. <laughs> but, but I think that makes sense that that would lead to a morbid right. fascination right. with, with so killers. The Harold and Maude thing. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, being obsessed you find comfort in it right, somehow. Yeah, yeah. It's a little misdirected, right? But but the what what I think is interesting is like I, I've been dating a woman who lost her mother at two, uh -huh. and she's got that same fear. Yeah, that like her mom died of some you know freakish thing, but it, it's definitely she's like I'm I'm going to die at that age. So did you literally think you were going to die at twenty four? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. That's wild. That would say that to kids in high school. You know, would would hang out with friends down at the creek, and you're having those deep conversations and that kind of thing. It was like. You know, I'd have these friends who are like, ah, I'm going to die young because I'm, you know, Party. I'm a rebel. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm going to die young because I'm supposed to. Oh, that's you know? a, <laughs> have, you, have you been able to process that much? I mean, do, do you find some reprieve uh, from it? I don't think about it as much as I used to. And pot for a long time dulled that, you yeah. know, and then therapy. And, and um, now it's it's uh, the kid. It's such an awesome thing that I, I just uh, 
I just want to stay healthy. So, and I know that's my way of controlling it is, is getting healthy and, and, um, yeah, doing what I can to, you know, keep my body alive. Well, well, yeah. And also I think that, you know, you seem, it's just good. To, you're, you're the uh, kind of guy where like, you know, when you came into yourself, like it doesn't always happen. You know, some people decide on personalities early on, they mm -hmm. somehow commit to it. I don't know how that happens. Right. But there are those of us who are sort of struggling for a sense of self for years, and when you see it happen, you're like, oh, my God, well, good for him. <laughs> you, well, it's almost like you arrive yeah. in your body. Well, we never finished that, so that's – it came after Mr. Show. Right. It came after kind of taking a break and then doing Just Shoot Me and um, – Oh, that's you know, right. Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, I fell into a great acting gig yeah. where you know, I was recurring – but I was doing enough episodes to where I could live off that every year. You got you know? insurance. I did it for four years, and, uh -huh. and, uh, and it was pretty great. And then I was also writing. I sold a couple of movies. And, Didn't uh, you write with Dave Anthony a bit? Uh, yeah, and then, but I wrote with Patton first. We, we sold a movie to Merrimax about stand-up. And they didn't make uh, it? No, they didn't make it, but uh, you, know, you got paid. Oh, hell yeah. And uh, did a couple of those, got some punch-up jobs, and sort of didn't need to do the road. And it wasn't like I got back into stand up because I needed to, right. but I missed it. Yeah. And you know, and everybody was doing Largo, and that was kind of the place where I fell into myself, or, or when I figured as it out. As a comic. Yeah, as a comic, really, where, um, you know, I, like I said, there was maybe four years where I wasn't, where I was maybe doing one set a year, even. Yeah. You know, or oh. if that, you know. Yeah. So there's like no stage time to get you better, but, yeah. but what it came from is kind of being more real. And, yeah. Uh, Talking about the things I actually cared about and, and rock and uh, roll, weed. yeah, but then also uh, obsession and sure. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. bringing in the nerdy references yeah, yeah. and those yeah. kind of things and and uh, that's kind of when I went, uh, this is already who I am, but that this is now definitely who I am on stage. I'm, that's I'm great. Finally, being myself. And, oh, that's fucking great. And comedians of comedy wound up being a really great thing for me to kind of get out and uh, work harder and and make that first hour. You know? Yeah, I, yeah. My first stand-up record's only five, six years old. Before yeah. that, didn't really have an act. You know, not only do you have a, a great comic disposition, but you know, you have a look, mm -hmm. and and certainly they use that. Yes, <laughs> and you're aware of that, right? You, know, you don't sit there and go, "You're not just hiring me because I'm big right. and nerdy looking." Well, it was funny. So back to the hair. Yeah, I cut my hair, and I swear, within a week, I got my first audition, and I nailed it. It was for Empty Nest. It was, uh, you know, that bad sitcom with. Uh, Christy McNichol was on it, uh -huh. and uh, and the guy from Soap. And uh, I went on that show, my first audition, nailed it, yeah. and uh, went on the show that week and uh, went, oh, I can do this. Yeah. I can be the guy that comes in and says something retarded <laughs> and walks out and get those kind of laughs, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and be Why not? this character-y guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I had grown up liking those guys on shows, sure. always thinking, uh, you know, there's that guy again. Yeah, there's the Jim J. Bullock yeah. on too Close for Comfort. Yeah. The, the Fay guy that comes in and says something weird and walks out. Yeah. Or, you know, and then there's the guy on Coach. Yeah. Who fit my look. Uh, um, is it Fagerbaki? Bill Fagerbaki? I don't know. A, a I think it's character a actor. pretty classic uh, comedy archetype. Yeah. Yeah, you know, sort of the, the large nerdy dude. Yeah. And yeah. I went, oh, I can do that. I yeah. can be the goofy neighbor. Or yeah. I can be uh, the guy that works with Spade at the, you know, yeah. and just shoot me and walks in and pushes the mail cart. Yeah. Says something weird. Everybody yeah. shakes their head and yeah. I walk off and, yeah. and high five the director because yeah. I killed. You and know? you can like, also be the big gay guy. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I had, well, that story, you know that story? I don't know any stories. Well, Sarah hired me at, to play Brian. It's not Sarah Silverman program, yeah. right. The character is Brian, yeah, and it's basically playing myself in the script. First script never comes up that I'm gay, right? So with the pilot cells, we're doing our first real episode, and I turn to Steve Agee after reading a couple of things. The guy who plays my boyfriend, yeah, and I go, "Dude, are we gay?" And he's like, "Are you a fucking idiot?" I'm like, yeah, I guess. You know, Sarah calls me and says, "Will you be on my show?" Yes, yeah, you know, yeah. we didn't even talk about it, right? It never came up, yeah. And, then, and I think that's what she wanted. I mean, that's... To know, have gay guys that don't act gay. What people loved about that show, yeah. or, or what they loved about our characters, yeah. is we weren't that type. We right. weren't uh, what you've seen on right. sitcoms since the beginning of sitcoms. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a, a stereotype. No. And that was fun, huh? Yeah, no, it was a blast. Yeah, I had A.G. in here about... Uh, uh, he had this long story. I should have him back in about you know, when he had to cry. There was a, a... Oh, yeah, that was a tough one for us. Yeah. My kid was just... Uh, was real little... And uh, was already having uh, his head was growing too fast, and and so I was kind of freaking out. And uh, 
So I was like looking at pictures of my kid backstage and listening to Tori Amos's version of uh, I Don't Like Mondays, you know, the Boomtown Rap yeah. song? Yeah. And it's like not what you'd think I would listen to anyway, right. but my, my wife uh, turned me on to her. And, but it's so moving. And then I'm looking at, I'm staring at pictures of my kid and I just, uh, the tears just came. And then I'd go, I'm ready. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, let's, let's do it fucking, now. <laughs> seriously. I'm in a bad, bad place. Like, I'm picturing my kid dead, and I'm listening to Tori Amos on my headphones. Yeah. And you I'm, both had a cry? Oh, yeah. We both had a cry because yeah. it was about us losing our son. We we make a robot who's our son, and it was such a goofy thing. Yeah. We're a fucking robot, you yeah. know, and then I pray to Satan to make the robot come to life. Right. And it's super silly, but our director, Rob Schraub, who wrote the episode, and he's really brilliant, uh, one of the smartest guys I've gotten to work with, like Odenkirk smart, you know? Right. And uh, he was like, I want you guys to play this stuff real. You know, I know it's a goofy script, but I want you to play the death real. And, and so we did. And, and uh, Steve and I, we actually worked on it for the, a couple weeks leading up to it. Like, we never would do that. Well, you wouldn't have rehearsal time on that show because there's no budget for it. But uh, for that, like, he wanted this to be, you know, cliche, a very special episode. He wanted it to be really cool. And so we uh, we read that together and... and uh, we taught, you know, it was like, are you guys going to be able to find this place? And on the set, I found that place. I don't know how Steve did it. But, well, uh, no, he had like, you know, he was really wrestling with it. And I, and I can't remember what the arc of, 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 of his frustration that he wanted to do it. But I remember what had happened was he built up to a point where he was so frustrated that he couldn't cry that he ended up crying and he yeah. couldn't stop crying. Right, right. I think he had a, t a slightly tougher time than I did because... I've done a little more acting, but I'm not schooled in acting. Like, no, right, I, you know, sure. I moved here, you know. Like, I think that, like, you know, I, I can access crying pretty... I, you know, I think I'm crying now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, but he had a... It was very challenging for him. And then once... I can't remember if there was a therapist were involved or, or that he was frustrated. And, and then, like... I remember on stage him being mad at himself and me... I'm trying to go through my own thing, but then also going, buddy, you're going to find it. Don't worry about yeah. it. You know, and he, then he said he, he couldn't He became stop. a really good friend. Yeah, we didn't really know each other before the show. Yeah. We'd maybe gotten high at Sarah's once or yeah. twice and played Goldeneye. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, it was the show that made us good friends. Yeah, he's a sweet guy. Yeah. But he said he couldn't stop crying. So your kid's okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. The head thing went away. I can't we imagine had, with your imagination where you were going with that. Oh my god! And my, you know, and I'm the husband, so yeah. I'm trying to keep the wife from going crazy and losing her mind every time we'd have to go to Cedar Sinai. Yeah, with a four month old baby and a six month old baby, and have them do tests. And um, you have two kids? Oh uh, no, no, no! But no. I mean, but that's, that's like the he two was month four, and, right. four and six or months when he was going through this thing, and his head was growing. Too fast. You and, noticed it? No, they they told us, and and uh, you know they would show us the chart, and here's where it should be, and here's where it is. So you're picturing some sort of bottled baby freak? Oh no, thing. I mean I grew up in, uh, you know, my mom worked with developmentally disabled, so I thought I was going to have a hydrocephalic kid, you know, oh. uh, waterhead, uh, yeah, and which, um, and that's what one of our doctors said he was going to be. You know, oh God! And this guy wound up being uh, such an asshole, but he was a specialist, and, yeah, and so we had to do all these tests, and you know, and and just taking your kid to have them do MRIs on them and, yeah. and all that stuff, and, yeah. and uh, it's no fun. Yeah, the baby that young, it's yeah, just hor horrible, and frightening. And, uh, and then I'd have to leave and go do stand up. So I was like, I had a breakdown at the at Denver airport. Uh, it yeah. was really grim. I'm sitting by myself, and uh, you know, I'm calling my my regular doctor, going, yeah. "Hey, can you help me through this?" Like she'd been my doctor since I moved to LA. Yeah. So I'm like. You know, can you call? Because I don't know what's going on, and I I don't understand this. And, yeah, and uh, she's like, "Well, it doesn't sound good." You know, I oh, talked to the other doctor. And, yeah, and uh, it was just a rough, rough couple of months. Yeah, but then it, now, and, and pot the doesn't necessarily help that shit, does it? No, I mean it would numb me, but then there'd be the times where I'm not. But don't you get? I, yeah. You never got loop like you yeah, never started yeah. spinning plates. Oh your... yeah, I did. I quit. Yeah, because uh, of that. I, I've been, uh, I've been. Uh, it'll be three weeks this week. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. No, Just I'm, now. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. No. So this is like a. And new I've never even talked about it on anything yet, but and it's weird because I'm the pot comic. Like I've just had to do shows. Talk where about I talk pot. about getting high with the audience, and then the audience afterwards. You know, in Florida a couple of weeks ago, there. You know, when when it that was my first week being sober, and I'm like, I have to make it through this. I don't want to be this guy anymore, and and uh, I don't like the way. It makes me feel it doesn't make me high anymore either. It's just I know. It's just me, a way of life. 
Ugh. It's like cigarettes. You're just getting normal. Yeah, and then listen to the Kevin Smith episode where he's a new guy to the yeah. pot, you know, oh, and yeah, I yeah. love him and I'm yeah. a big fan. But to hear him talking about it, it's like, oh, I wish I could do that. Like, <laughs> well, Bring that it back. It just doesn't feel like that anymore. What did it start to feel like? Uh... Did you? Wait, let me just ask you this. When I stopped, I mean, I haven't done anything in a long time, but but pot, I'd go on and off it because it'd get to a point. I had this weird thing happen where you really don't know if you're high or not, mm-hmm. and but you do know that you're detached. Yeah, yeah, that's and, it. Yeah, and and like I I went. My great aunt was dying uh, up in Boston, and I went with my first wife to visit her, and and I'd been smoking, you know, daily for a long time. And uh, she was losing it, you know. She, uh, she was getting a uh, um, dementia. Dementia. Part of that's it, yeah. right? And and she like, you know, she's just like kind of fragmented. And she's looking at me, and she goes, "What's wrong with Mark? He looks haunted." Uh, and I'm like, "That's got to be the thought." But so you, you just stopped. Yeah, and it was. Uh, I don't want my kid. You know, I want to get healthy, but then also, uh, I don't want to have to have that talk. Yeah, you know, like Daddy oh, well, can it's do okay it. for you, right? You know, right. and that's a, that's part of it. But then uh, I also hated who I was, and I hated that I that that became my thing, and and uh, that defined you. Yeah, I don't. I've always been kind of a rebel. Yeah, you know, I hate that sounds lame, but I I I never want to be like everybody else. Right, and I, I it just became, and I started to be, you know, and I knew that was part of my reputation. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I I held on to it for a long time. Sure. But uh, it it was a couple different things. I've been thinking about it for a while and talking to a therapist about it for a while. And, and finally, a couple weeks ago, she's like, if you're serious about this, this is what you need to do. And you should, you know, even though you think meetings are for assholes and you don't need a meeting, yeah. you should go Try to a fucking it. meeting. Yeah. And I called a friend and yeah. went to a meeting. And, yeah. and uh, that really helped. And I've only been to two so far. Pot but, meeting? Uh, no, no regular. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I didn't want to go to NA because that's like it's guys little, with real problems. It's a little crazy. Yeah. You know, I'd feel like such a yeah. pussy. Like yeah. going, Whatever yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I spend yeah. 200 bucks a month on weed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Some guy's saying, I lost my leg from <laughs> yeah, gangrene. Yeah. And right, right, right. In jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, well, that's uh, good, man. Do you feel better? I do. And um, What are the most noticeable differences? Uh I feel like a cloud's lifting, but it's it's taking a little while. Yeah, and I'm cranky again. But uh, I went through a period at Mister Show where I quit. Yeah, and Dino Stamatopoulos took me aside, one of the writers, yeah, one of I the know. head writers. I had him in here. Yeah, and uh, he actually said, "Hey, you're an asshole when yeah. you're not high. Like you should yeah. get high again." And, oh, good. You yeah. know, Satan speaks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I bought it. Yeah, you know, and sure. I started smoking pot again because yeah. I I do get mood swings. Um, just a couple of days ago, I got really cranky, and for like two days in a row, my wife noticed and said, she even almost was to the point of, "God damn it, go smoke out in the backyard pot. and smoke." Yeah, but I'm not gonna. And, well, that's uh, a weird thing when you're obsessive. That like you know, if there's a little kernel of something that makes you cranky, you fucking lock yeah. in. Well, that became the thing. I mean, uh, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to quit is yeah. because I realized. Uh, my dogs would be whining, and yeah. so I'd have to go out in the backyard and get high. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. Rath would call me with bad news, so I'd have to go out in the backyard and get high. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, because that also, once once the baby came and then weed became delegated to this thing you couldn't do in your house anymore, it was yeah. no longer free, I can't do it in the living room, right. I can't do it in my office. Right. And, like, even when she was pregnant, I couldn't do it anymore. Right. Uh, you know, she can't be walking through a cloud of smoke to go into the kitchen. Right. And, um... So it became this outside thing. Yeah. So once it became an outside thing, it was like, yeah. I feel like a loser. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm in my nice backyard, but I'm out here because I have to be out here yeah. with this fucking gross habit. Right. You know, and, and that was sort of the beginning and the end for me of, of uh, you know, finally going, oh, I've, I have to stop this thing. Well, it was I, like a couple different things at once. But. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I, I hope. Uh, yeah, talk to me six months from now when I'm back right in it. But, you know. Well, yeah, but that's all right. I mean, you, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not encouraging it, but any sort of distance you can take from it. To, to, it's almost like, you know, I got to see who I am for a few right. weeks. And you just yeah. chose not to go the edible route or any of that shit. You just want to be off it. I just want to be clear headed for a little while. That's and, great. Uh, I have some stuff I need need to do I, I have some writing i need to really focus on Are you working on something yeah i'm working on metalocalypse now but i also uh, like I all that. of our friends have the book deal looming you know so yeah. uh the only way i'm ever going to write that book is if i sit down and when's do yours it. due yeah no shit uh no i don't actually i i'm at the point where 
I've got a couple people that want to hear the pitch, and I don't even have the pitch yet. Oh, you know? so it's one of those. Yeah, I just got one. I got to I got to focus. Yeah, and uh, sit down and get yeah, and they'll probably be done. like, we think maybe you ought to do a pot book. <laughs> yeah, like, uh... and they, they want it to be the metal nerd thing, but I I want it to be more telling all my stories. I have a lot of different stories about you know how I got here. Yeah, yeah, we got a couple in today. Yeah, who are your guys? Your metal guys right now? Uh Still, uh, my main two bands are Iron Maiden and Metallica, and then Rush, which is an even metal. But, uh, Rush <laughs> is one of my favorite bands of all time. and uh, that's You know, I, I met them. Do you meet them? Not yet. I kind of don't want to. Yeah, you're probably better off. Were they not great? Well, I mean, I used to work for a restaurant when I was in high school that catered concerts. And, oh, I, wow. ended, and I ended up seeing Rush like two or three times, and I was not a huge Rush guy. Oh, no? You know, I mean, I'm just, I, you know, I've Well, only... I know, yeah, you went Velvet Underground and all, yeah, all that well, stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, well, yeah. No, well, back then it was probably Stones and, right. you know, something. Right. But I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'll nerd out, but not for very long on things. Uh-huh. Like, I don't, I, I'm still committed to the bands that I was programmed with as a kid. Right. Uh, but you know, I met those guys. I literally had to drive up to my boss's house to get the guitar player. What's his name? Alex Lifeson. Alex Lifeson, a fan, because he he was too hot in his dressing room, and it was just like one of those things where you know, yeah. I walk in and he's like there with his you know like a guitar, just like practicing on a classical, getting ready. I'm like, do you want me to put the fan here? And he wouldn't even look up and get oh, leaves. Oh man, and, you know, they were they were, but they were rock stars. I mean, right. you don't expect they weren't. Yeah. I didn't look at them as assholes, All right? You know, because they always had that, uh, you know, that they that, were kind of the smart, uh, right? Rock exactly. Stars too. You know, yeah, you're like you yeah. almost didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. I mean, he's right, sitting there right. practicing on a classical guitar yeah. Yeah. in his dressing yeah. room. Now, have you been able? Because I see, like, when I talk to people that are true fans of people, have you had? Have you been able to to meet like Les Claypool or anybody that you know that you've always wanted to meet? I haven't met Les, but I've met almost everybody else. Yeah, uh, you know, the fact that one of my closest friends is the guitar player for Anthrax is still surreal to me yeah, you know I like bet, anthrax yeah. is one of those bands that they had a sense of humor too and then they also uh had stephen king influenced uh lyrics and and i was big stephen king guy yeah I still am and uh so like for that guy to be at my wedding and for that guy to be who my wife and i take you know couples trips with him and uh, my wife and his uh, wife yeah. are best friends yeah it's still weird, you know? <laughs> like, he's appeared on both my records, and yeah. the fact that Scott Ian is one of my friends, it's like it's like something I, you know, used to <laughs> fantasize about, or, you know? Like, and now you're not high anymore. It's a, you're going to be like, it's just really happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fog is lifted, and it's still weird, yeah. Uh, and then meeting Metallica, you know, I met them growing up, and they weren't nice when I was a teenager, but now uh, I'm friends with Kirk, the guitar player. Really? And, yeah, yeah, It's 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 cool. That's great. And then all these like younger bands that I like, they liked me from Mr. Show and all these other places, so it's it's cool. Like Are you able to turn off the fanboy shit? Uh yeah, I mean, well the first time I met Scott from Anthrax, I was shaking like I thought my leg was going to lock up. Like, you know, you know when you're nervous and you and you straighten it out. Yeah, yeah. And then you're like, "Oh, I'm going to fucking pass out." Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, cuz I walked into I went to see Anthrax by myself like you know, because I don't have a lot of metal friends, because all our friends like Elvis Costello. Yeah, I know, right. Yeah. And all that yeah. <laughs> Which I like. Yeah. But I There's don't... definitely the pop nerds and the metal nerds. Right. Yeah. You know, but all our close friends, oh, yeah. you know, or especially my really close friends, yeah. Patton would never go to a metal show with me. Yeah. You know, or any of these other guys. So I used to go to metal shows by myself if yeah. I couldn't get the wife to go. Yeah. And I was at this Anthrax show, and... uh the roadie came up and goes, uh, hey, does Scott know you're here? And I'm like, no, I don't know Scott. And he's like, uh, well, he'll freak out. Do you want to go meet him? And I'm like, well, fuck yeah. You know, it's at the House of Blues. <laughs> and uh, they're about to go on. Yeah. I walk into the dressing room. It's all Anthrax yeah. and Slayer yeah. is hanging out. Right. They're not even on the bill, but right. all the guys from Slayer came yeah. to the show to hang out. Right. I'm shitting. And I'm by myself, so I don't even have, like, my friend who I can go, dude, is this fucking happening? Yeah, yeah. It's all in my head. Yeah. And I'm playing it cool, like, because he's nerding out on me. He's yeah. like, Mr. Show's the greatest show ever. Yeah. And he's yelling at the guys in Slayer who yeah. have no fucking idea because they don't really have a sense of humor. Right. And anyway, uh, <laughs> he's like, this guy's fucking funny, and he yeah. wrote on one of the funniest shows. Yeah. And I'm just losing yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I thought I would never talk to this guy again, and then we wound up being friends. Like, we really connected, and, and uh, like uh, the roadie like got my info. Yeah. And uh, kind of the roadie helped us be, kind of become friends because uh-huh. I was hanging out with the roadie a couple times after that. Right. And high and whatever, oh, that's but, a fucking great story. Yeah. And uh, what else? Who? And, what, are, what are some other classic meetings? 
uh, having Dio come to my house. He passed away, right? Yeah, yeah. We lost him last year, and and uh, um, you he know, came and, to your house. Yeah, we. Uh, you know, I I hosted this show. It's like uh, the Metal Awards, basically. Yeah. You know, they have them in Britain every year, but America never had like a real heavy metal award. And uh, it's the third year now coming up. Uh, I'm going to be presenting in a thing, but uh, the first year, two years ago, I hosted it, and uh, it was when uh, I met. Um, more metal than you wasn't out yet, but metal by numbers had done well in yeah. that area. And like, I got like two million YouTube hits, and all these metal kids knew me because of that. And so I made that leap. The second record, uh, the first record. Okay, I had this song and uh, Revolver, the, this big metal American metal magazine. Yeah, they asked me to host. Yeah, and so we're doing this bit, and I write this bit in, uh, for the opening. You know, like me kind of preparing, like how do I make myself metal? And yeah, so I have these guys come to my house, and Scott, you know, was my friend by then. Yeah, so he's in the bit. And then we had Vinnie Paul, the drummer for Pantera, uh -huh. one of my all-time favorite bands. He shows up, and that's already weird. Yeah. And then we got Dio to be in the bit, and uh, you know, where I'm praying to Satan. Yeah. And then Dio shows up, and and, uh, and I'm like, Satan? And it's like, no, it's Ronnie. You know, and I turn around, and <laughs> yeah. it's a funny thing. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm backwards and masking on my you know turntable yeah. and all that. Yeah. And Ronnie, I summon Ronnie James. Right. And. Uh, it's the coolest guy ever, and he's in. We're hanging out because we're shooting, and you know that shit moves slow. Yeah. And so at one point, Ronnie James Dio is in my backyard, you know, sitting on, on my chase lounge by my pool, yeah. and I'm just in my living room going, "Fuck!" Like taking a picture of him <laughs> through my window. Like, look who's in my backyard, you know. And then we bonded. Yeah, he, yeah. He wound up being a really nice guy who loves comedy. He knew who I was. He knew who some of our friends are. Yeah, and uh, it was really surreal and just the sweetest older, you know, older guy. And, yeah, but somebody I've liked since 1980. Yeah, isn't it interesting when you find that the, the, how aware they are of their being a performer? Like yeah. you know, a lot of times you meet these metal dudes or, or dudes who are in bands, but that once they get off stage. They're just guys. Yeah, yeah. And and but they're but very he's considered a god in that world. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Like, well, yeah. He's one of those guys. Was he uh, your guy when you were in high school and shit? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, mob rules and uh, when 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 Ozzy left Black Sabbath, uh, yeah, I. I, I well, a lot of Black Sabbath nerds would get mad. I kind of like the Dio version of Black Sabbath more than I like the Ozzy version. I have all those Ozzy records. Yeah. And I love the Ozzy solo stuff. Yeah. But uh, I'd put Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules ahead of uh, any of those older Sabbath records. Just because of his voice and the drive? Dio, yeah, yeah. He yeah, just yeah. made him a different band. He made him more evil, yeah, I yeah. think. Like, yeah. There was something about them. It, it yeah. Just, uh, more epic. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I, I really dug that. I always like guys with operatic voices, like Bruce Dickinson's one of my favorite singers for Iron Maiden. And, yeah, I, you yeah. know, Mishnah took me to see them once, and I didn't know much about them. Yeah. And you guys sort of bonded around the metal shit. Yeah, well, I, I was like... You know who's this cute girl that knows Megadeth? Like yeah, yeah. that never happens. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I've been to Megadeth shows. And yeah, it's like, yeah. Where the fuck was she? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if she's into it anymore, but right. she was definitely an Ozzy, uh, you know, Megadeth. But but I went to an Iron Maiden show, and I and I and I do like I like I don't know their catalog, but I'll listen to uh to Run for Your Life. Right, yeah. Run it, to the Hills. Run yeah. to the Hills. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, now I feel like now that's all right. Now all your nerd <laughs> no, people are going to be like, oh man, trying to fucking. <laughs> that's all right. But, Patton did this thing. Patton met uh, Dio, and uh, he goes. He went up to Dio, and he goes, uh, "Hey, I love, uh, oh no!" He tried to bond with him because he thought Dio has the song "Last in Line," yeah, and he thought the uh, song was "Next in Line," yeah. And they're uh, they're uh, getting on a plane, and yeah. He's like, "Hey, you're the next in line," and Dio turns around and goes, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> You know, yeah, but, but, oh, so, Pat, then, but, so Patton's like, why didn't that joke fly? And I'm like, because you got the reference wrong, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love to see Jeff Patton's face on that. <laughs> Failing a joke. That, like, that's one of those moments that even, yeah. no matter how callous you are as a comic, that's going to hurt. Yeah, you yeah. fucked it up. It, it's but one of those moments. But then he was, Dio wound up being, Dio's such a nice guy that yeah. Dio was like, oh, you're, but, you know, knew oh. who he was and was cool to him and, right. and all that. It's also but, interesting, like, the, the I guess, like, in the Sabbath with Dio and the Sabbath with uh, Ozzy, it's like, they're two different types of uh, kind of metal clown in a way, mm -hmm. and I, I don't mean that in a negative I know way. What you mean. That you know their their personas are are different in terms of how they approach the evil, right. you know, personification thing. Right, right. You know, Ozzy is sort of like I'm a little crazy. Well, and he was so drugged up. Dio was never like that. Yeah, you know, Dio was pretty more focused. And did you meet Ozzy? Yeah, uh, not that he would remember. Right, <laughs> but uh, 
No, not like not like hanging out. I can just, see you hanging just out like with shaking his hand and with Les. You still like Les? Yeah, I love him. I'd love to meet that guy. Yeah, um, that but, the, uh, the fact that they performed uh, Pink Floyd's Animals is is, is astounding to me because I love that record. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I I mean, I listened to the fuck out of that record at some point, and that he honored it somehow. It's because right it, it, it's sort of a it's it's not it's a pretty huge Pink Floyd album, uh-huh. but it's not the one everyone knows. But like the arc of that album is so fucking beautiful. I mean, do you listen to them? Uh, I do, but the weird thing for me is I hated them in high school. Oh, really? Yeah, because they weren't the heavy wall? enough. They weren't heavy enough. Right, and right. the wall was super popular. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. kids that liked The Clash, I didn't like then, and I like now. Mm-hmm. And uh, Pink Floyd, I didn't like then, and I like now. Elvis Costello, I would never listen to back then. Yeah. Because I was so just... You Those that. guys were just into their thing, the guys that liked that band. Yeah, yeah. And they thought I was retarded for drawing Iron Maiden on my folder. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. But you need to drive. I mean, right. whatever your music moves you in a certain yeah. way. Well, fuck, Brian, it's great talking to you. I'm so glad things Man, yeah. are, uh, glad are working out. I'm glad we finally out. got to do this. It's great. I don't think we've ever had uh, more than a 10-minute conversation. <laughs> no, I think this is the longest we've talked since New York uh, yeah. 20 yeah. years ago. Which I barely remember, and I apologize right. for that. That's all right, man. Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, that's our show. I hope you enjoyed that, uh, people. I, I really like talking to Brian. Uh, go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF uh, needs. Got the brand new site. Get on the email list. Get some JustCoffee.coop. Get some, uh, go to the app store. Buy, get, get yourself a WTF app. You can hear all those old episodes streaming with the app premium. You can also go to, uh, to the site and pick up uh, some of those uh, premium episodes from the old days. Robin Williams, Carlos Mencia, Louis C.K., Judd Apatow, Zach Galifianakis, Dave Attell. Uh, who else is there? We're putting new ones up all the time. If you missed out on those originally, you can download the MP3s at WTFPodshop.com or go to WTF Premium on iTunes. Oh, my God. I got to go. I got to get out of here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I hope I make it out of Foxwoods. Foxwoods.